So in other words, when we look at the Ten Commandments, we see how holy God is, and we can see how sinful we are. We fall short. Now, what does holy mean? Holy means set apart. Set apart from what? Set apart from sin. God is set apart from sin when we say he is holy, holy, holy. In Isaiah chapter 64, 6, it states that even our righteous acts are but filthy rags in front of a holy and righteous God. So even on our best day, even when we do these righteous deeds, we are but filthy, putrid, rancid, maggot, infested rags to a holy God. Since God is holy and we are all filthy and sinful, can we approach God? Can we safely enter into his holy presence? No, absolutely not. We are all sinners, violators of the law. We are all set apart from a holy and righteous God. In Revelations chapter 21, verse 27, it says that no one unclean can enter the kingdom of God. That means uh, no one with sin can enter God's holy presence. So this standard, it leaves us failures, unable to meet his criteria of holiness and righteousness and goodness. At the end of the day, no matter how much we try, the law can only kill us, not save us. The law is powerless to save. Okay, a case in point, okay, we said the law is like a mirror. And a mirror uh, will expose the mud that I have on my face, okay, but can it clean it? Do I use the mirror to clean my face? N no. Um, if I have messy hair, if my hair is all messy, do I use the mirror to uh, comb my hair? Of course not. Okay? If I have a huge zit on my face, do I go up to the mirror and try to pop the zit with the mirror? Of course not. Thus, any attempt to save ourselves through the law is futile. It's vain. That's bad news for us. Bad news, therefore, shuts us up and puts us in our place hopeless and helpless, dead in our sin. Now, are you ready for the good news? In Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, it says, The law is a schoolmaster that drives us to Christ. This is God, I mean, Jesus is the gospel. So the question is, what is the gospel? What is the good news? Before we go there, let me just say that everyone loves good news, I'm sure. Uh, but what do you do when you don't understand the good news that's been given to you? Okay, a case in point. Okay, let's pretend, let's imagine uh, your friend comes to you with a huge smile on his face. Okay, and he says, hey, I got some good news. Are you ready? And you're eager to hear the good news. You say, ah, oh, yeah, I'm ready. Give it to me. What is it? The good news is me. And you scratch your head, confused, and you think your friend has gone crazy. Okay? Uh, in the same way, although no one saw it during Jesus' earthly ministry, the announcement, the good news is me, was exactly the declaration that Jesus Christ was making. How is Jesus Christ the good news, you ask? Well, the good news, the gospel, can be encapsulated in the following historical events. Okay? Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. In Hebrews, okay, let's start with uh, Jesus' life as good news. In Hebrews 4.15, it says that we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. If you recall, Jesus was tempted by Satan in the desert for 40 days. Yet he did not succumb to sin. The Israelites as well were also tempted in the desert for 40 years. Yet they failed. Under Moses' leadership, they all died in the desert. God commanded his people to obey the law or else they would surely die. They failed to obey the law. And thus they were not permitted by God to enter the promised land. Another failure we see in the Bible is Adam. If you recall, God put Adam in the Garden of Eden and commanded him in Genesis 
From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day, uh, for in that day you eat from it, you shall surely die. Unfortunately, Adam succumbs to Satan's temptation, thereby disobeying God. And sin has plagued man ever since. Adam and Israel both fulfilled, both failed to fulfill God's purposes for humanity, and so both died. Adam died outside the Garden of Eden, outside of paradise. And the Israelites died in the desert, just outside the promised land, the land flowing of milk and honey. And the result was, a, was the same, death and exclusion from the land. We too, as the law reveals to us, we are in the same boat. We are failures just as Israel in the desert and like Adam in the garden. We are all failures. Adam being our federal head and Israel being our corporate representatives. We are all failures all together. As said in Romans chapter 5 verse 12, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. All of us have failed to keep God's commandments perfectly. We must face the same result as Adam and the Israelites. Death and exclusion from God's kingdom. But fortunately, however, there is good news. One has passed the test. This one was all part of God's redemptive plan, you see. Immediately after Adam sins in the garden and no one is left, uh, no hope is left for a mankind, rather. God preaches the gospel. Knowing that mankind is now doomed to die, God offers hope in Genesis 3.15. He's, God will put hostility between Satan and the woman, between Satan's seed, which is Satan's offspring, and the woman's seed. The woman's seed will crush the head of Satan's offspring, and Satan's offspring will strike the heel of of the woman's offspring. So who is this promised seed of the woman that would crush the, uh, that would crush Satan's head? The New Testament reveals to us the seed is Christ, Galatians 3:16. In Galatians 3:16 it says, "Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed." He does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one. And to your seed, that is Christ. In Christ, God partook flesh and blood. And that is, he shared in our humanity, becoming like us, and was tempted like we are tempted, yet without sin, so that we shall be saved by his life. And so it is through Christ's fulfillment of the law, Christ has married the title, Holy and Righteous One. Now, one excludes the rest of us. In order for us to stop relying on ourselves and to eradicate any self-righteousness, we must realize that only one is righteous. We must realize that only one is holy. Only one is without sin. And only one is victorious over sin and death. And he's also victorious, ultimately, over Satan as well. That one is none other than the spotless lamb, Jesus Christ. By virtue of his faithfulness and perfect obedience, he is the obedient Adam. He is true Israel. He is the seed that breaks the curse that was placed on Adam and the rest of mankind, thereby rendering the serpent who had the power of death powerless. Therefore, it is only through trusting Christ's righteousness and obedience for our righteousness and obedience can we graciously and mercifully be rendered by God as obedient and righteous. Christ says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5 and 6, Sacrifice and offerings God did not desire, but a body. With burnt offerings and sin offerings God was not pleased. Then I, this is Jesus speaking, said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will. It is by this will, 
Christ's obedience. We are holy through the body of Jesus Christ that was sacrificed once and for all by resting our trust in Christ alone. But Christ's obedience and righteousness is imputed, that is attributed, credited to sinners like us. This imputation of his righteousness is how Christ becomes good news to us.